Yeah, I want to, oops, I want to thank Christy and the Nebraska Realtors for inviting me to be part of this um, little program for y'all today. I'm really kind of excited to talk to y'all today. It's been a while. Um, like Christy mentioned, I did leave the program for a little bit and went to an area of direct position, but then uh, had an opportunity to come back to the housing programs as program director. And I'm so excited to be back because this is kind of the program that I grew up with that I love. Um, and I, I just think it's a great program. So again, my name is Krista Metcher, been with the agency for a long time. Uh, I won't tell you how old I am because that's just not cool. Um, I will be your tour guide on this little journey through our single family housing programs. I'm gonna give you a couple of disclosures before we go. The first one is that I am working at home and I do have a toy Australian Shepherd. And just like a child, every time I get on a meeting or a phone call, that's when he picks up his squeaky toy and runs to me, squeaking it like crazy. So I'm gonna try to hope he just mellows out and <laughs> lays down so we don't have that interruption. And the other disclosure is that my daughter tells me all the time that I'm very extra. So <laughs> you'll probably see that in my presentation. I can't help myself. I do my best to make this boring government uh, information as entertaining as I can. So um, with that, let's just start our little journey onto the information about our single family housing programs under the USDA rural development. Okay, maybe it's lagging here, I need to forward. And immediately I am frozen, wonderful. Let me get out and see. There we go. Is it changing for you guys? You see it? Okay, great. Sorry about that. It just froze up. First of all, USDA rural development. Well, who in the heck is that? Um, just a little bit of trivia. Uh, USDA was started uh, by Abraham Lincoln back in 1862. So it's much, much older than I am. That's what we like. Um, for some of you that have been around for a long time, you might remember the Farmers Home Administration. Uh, that's what the agency kind of started out as. Uh, back in 1996, it split into two agencies, uh, the Farm Service Agency, or FSA, and then RD, or Rural Development. Of course, the farm programs went with FSA, and then Rural Development kept all the housing programs. And we have another, uh, a couple other programs that came over to rural development too. So this is our mission, committed to helping improve the economy and quality of life in rural America. Now, this is not a mission that's impossible. Uh, this is something that we work out every day. We're having great success with, but we need everybody's help to, to complete this mission. So under our rural development business uh, and energy programs, we have an umbrella that has all these other programs. Uh, we have business programs, we have community facilities, and we have multifamily housing programs. There's actually um, apartment complexes in rural communities that people get subsidized rents. Uh, we do fire trucks, we do um, fire stations, we can do any kind of energy improvements to businesses. So just a lot of different programs under that rural, rural development umbrella. In fact, I think we have about 40 different programs. So when you think of USDA rural development, what's the first thing that you all think of? Any guesses? Anyone? <laughs> Probably not home purchase financing. <laughs> We do have a lot of people that call us because we're the USDA. Way around it. Can't you just do the right thing? And God, I just don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody. Um, anyway, <laughs> sorry for the interruption there. We um, home purchase financing is probably not the first thing you think of when you think of USDA. Uh, we do have a lot of phone calls from different people asking us about packing plans. And testing animal spit or removing bats. And that's not really what we specialize in. We actually have these home financing programs available. One thing we don't have is a budget for advertising. So a lot of the ways that we get the message out on our programs is word of mouth, 
um, doing programs like this for all of you. We'll go out into communities and do programs. Um, you know, so it's just kind of a word of mouth. It's, it's kind of a well-kept secret. Um, not everybody knows about these programs. And I'm sure some of the realtors that have been around for a while do know, you know, are aware of our programs. But I know we also have a lot of new realtors coming up into the ranks. And so um, that might be something that they're not as familiar with. So today what we're gonna focus on is our single family housing home purchase programs. And like I mentioned, this is kind of my, my thing, my love, the program that I've grown up with. Um, and I just think this is, uh, these are both great programs. We have a couple different ones. I'm gonna talk about them separately, but um, these are just really great programs that are available. And I'll kind of go through um, some details on each and then you'll see why I think that they're great programs. So what is the big deal about rural development home purchase programs? Like what makes them so great compared to all the other ones out there? Well, they're 100% financing. That's kind of our big wow factor. There just aren't a lot of programs out there that are 100% financing unless you qualify for like the VA programs. Um, as you all know, with uh, like FHA, you do have to have like a three and a half percent down payment. Um, and a lot of people in today's world just don't have that kind of money saved up. So there is an option here that we can provide this 100% financing. So um, this is something that works really great for young families, single parents, um, even traditional families use it a lot too. But, but that's kind of the big wow factor. It is 100% financing. Of course, we have a lot of partners involved uh, with us. We have our realtors, like all of you. We do have lenders. Uh, we work with NIFA, uh, the Nebraska Housing Developers and nonprofit organizations. We can partner with any uh, down payment assistance programs, any employer assistance programs. We can do purchase rehab resale programs. Uh, we work with DED through some of their funding. Um, we've partnered a lot with the Federal Home Loan Bank of Topeka and gotten people down payment assistance. Uh, Nebraska, uh, Nebraska Assistive Technology has even come in and done some rehab in some of these homes for us, made bathrooms handicapped accessible. Um, HUD helps us spread the word and you know just a lot of others. But we, we just work with a lot of people across Nebraska to bring some of these deals together for our rural citizens. And please, anybody, if you have questions as we go along, feel free to unmute and shout them out because I'm very informal, as you can tell by my presentation. So we'll put them in the chat and Christy will try to track those for me. And we'll have a little session at the end to answer questions if you have any. So what does affordable housing provide? Well, it's social and economic benefits. The families can build their assets, pride of home ownership, et cetera. I'm sure you're all pretty versed in what affordable housing can provide in communities. Some of the barriers that we see to affordable housing, uh, probably the biggest one is that lack of cash for a down payment. Just a lot of people aren't able to save that type of money. Uh, inability to meet housing costs. Of course, with the low interest rates right now, that isn't quite as big of an issue as it has been in the past. We still have some old loans that have 8% interest, 14% interest. It's, it's insane how high the interest rates used to be uh, as you're looking at them now. Uh, lack of available or substandard existing housing or available, uh, availability of suitable financing, which again, I think goes back to that lack of cash for down payment. So these are just some of the some of the struggles some of our applicants do deal with. So what exactly is affordable housing? Well, just like everything else, it comes down to money. Uh, typically when a cost is no more than 30% of the household's income, and we do have some income guidelines that uh, are eligible or applicable to our programs, and I'll share those with you in a little bit here. But typically 30% um, of our income guidelines is what we would consider affordable housing. So, so these aren't the big mansions, um, but people do need affordable housing. Um, it's still, still a real deal. It still exists out in our rural communities. 
Uh, housing is the American dream. I know you guys know that probably better than anybody. Um, and it's still alive and well. Um, I, I know a lot of people talk about, oh, these millennials don't want to buy homes and settle down. They want to be mobile. But I think there is still a lot of people wanting to own their own homes, especially in Nebraska, where we're a little bit more of a rural communities. Um, keys to home ownership. Another portion of our programs is that we want to get people into homes and we want them to stay in their homes. Um, we're not going to let somebody just go out and buy a, a you know, a dump. Um, a lot of our applicants are not going to have the funds to fix those homes up. Um, you know, we're talking very low to moderate income, just don't have a lot of money set aside. Um, the other thing is that we want to keep the people in their homes. So we do have a lot of servicing options. If they do get into some financial difficulties, we have different options that we can offer them. We can have uh, delinquency workout agreements. We have moratoriums to delay their payments. Um, we really do about everything we can to keep people in their homes. Um, we definitely don't want to foreclose on people. Um, sometimes we end up having to do that, but our foreclosure rate isn't any higher than any of the uh, other programs. So um, it is something we try to work with people on give them every opportunity to stay in their homes if they can um, and keep that okay, so we have a question already sure are there any restrictions regarding properties that have been rehabbed um really not we don't have like a flipping rule or anything like that so you know i know some um programs uh if it's a flip property or something there's a waiting period but we don't have that at all does that answer that question? Hopefully, is that maybe what they were getting at? I hope so. We'll see. Okay. <laughs> okay. So what is the meaning of rural for single family housing programs under rural development? Well, I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> Basically, all communities in Nebraska are eligible except Fremont, Grand Island, Hastings, Kearney, Lincoln, North Platte, Omaha, and South Sioux and Dakota City. Now, I know that seems kind of like a big list, but I Googled and there, uh, the Google told me, I sound old when I say that, the Google told me that there are 895 cities, towns, and villages in Nebraska. I was kind of surprised by that. That's, that's a huge number. So as you can see, this is just kind of the more metropolitan areas that don't aren't considered rural, but everything else in Nebraska would qualify as rural. All of the other communities, uh, some of the communities surrounding these areas do qualify as well. Uh, for example, Omaha does not qualify, but Gretna does qualify. Lincoln doesn't qualify, but Waverly qualifies. So some of those surrounding areas from these cities do still qualify. So don't just, you know, take it that they're not going to, and I'll show you a place where you can check uh, the properties as well. So of course now is a great time to buy the home, but duh, you guys know that. I'm preaching to the choir here. Uh, home sales are definitely hot right now. And the one caveat that I will say is that government financing is probably not at the top of the list for people buying homes right now. This market is so hot with the low interest rates. I will say that um, some of our customers are having a little bit of trouble finding homes. Uh, people are coming in with cash offers, uh, offers with no inspections, and um, you know that's what's getting most of the properties. So our, our borrowers are definitely having a little bit more trouble uh, finding properties to purchase right now. But I think we have historically seen that. Uh, you know, that kind of ebbs and flows. Um, it gets like this for a while, but eventually the government financing starts coming back into play. So just something I did want to mention, but I'm sure this market is going to probably turn around a bit. And I still want you all to be um, knowledgeable about the program so that you can help. Um, some of these borrowers are still able to find properties in the rural areas, but we're probably not the, the top of the list at this point. So we do have two very distinctly different programs for home ownership. And I'm gonna talk about each of these individually. The first one is our 502 direct loan. 
And the next one is our 502 guaranteed loan. So the first one we're gonna talk a bit about is our direct program. So under the direct program, funding is appropriated from Congress. Um, we need to try to use these funds the best we can. The thing that I will tell you is that if we don't use the funds in Nebraska, they're gonna go to other states. So the big states like Texas and California. Um, if we get to a point at the end of our fiscal year, which will be coming up in September, we're almost there, where did this year go? Um, if we get to that point at the end and we still have funds available, those funds will be uh, pooled and redistributed to those other big states that have a need for it. Um, I kind of think we probably, this is gonna be one of the few years that we probably are gonna lose some of our funds just because of this, like I mentioned, the crazy market that, that we're seeing right now. Um, but you know, as we go on through uh, fiscal year 22, which will start in October and upcoming years, hopefully we'll be able to have better utilization of our funding. Because we would really like to keep that here in rural Nebraska and not have it go to those bigger, bigger states. So here are some of the highlights of our 502 direct program. Again, it's 100% financing. The primary goal is to provide affordable quality housing to income eligible households. We do have to count the income for all household members. So anybody living in that house, if you have grandma in the bedroom down the hall or uncle Joe in the basement, and they're gonna live there, we have to count their income in as well. We can utilize this for new construction or existing dwellings. Under this program, we do have mortgage limits and I'll share those with you in just some upcoming slides. It's a 33 year loan. The current interest rate is 2.5%. And that payment assistance, it's actually a subsidized loan if they qualify for it but on household size and income that can reduce that rate to as low as 1%. That allows people a little more borrowing power. Um, they can stretch that those funds at 1% a bit more than they could at the 2.5%. Not a huge difference right now with the interest rates being so low, but we do still have a lot of uh, you know, single income households or fixed income households that that subsidy and that 1% does still help them out. We can also finance repairs and closing costs under this program. Um, just the appraisal has to support that and able for us to do so. We will get a list of the repairs that need to be done or that they want to have made and then we'll get the property appraised as improved and we can loan up to 100% of that as improved appraised value. They can also use some of those funds for closing costs if they need to, um, if there aren't a lot of repairs to be made uh, and so on. So here's a peek at our income limits for this program. These are new income limits that were effective in May. Um, and it goes from a household of one through four people and then five through eight people. Um, so you can kind of take a look there at your respective county that they'd be purchasing in and see what those income limits are. They have increased pretty significantly over the years. Um, and if you don't see your county there, then it's way at the bottom in the all other counties. So you see that a household of one through four in all other counties could go up to $57,300 and five through eight people could go up to $75,650. And it does vary by county. So you can check out, uh, take a look at those and, and check them out. And I do have some of this information as far as income limits, staff contacts, uh, some of those things. And I can certainly forward those out um, to Christy to send out to any, everybody or anybody that wants them, so. A little bit on credit Jessica, under, yes. Will you be sending me your PowerPoint after the, pro, after the presentation? I certainly can. Thank you. Yep. yep, I'll send that along with a few other kind of reference things that you can send out. Thank you quick drink. Okay, a little bit about credit. The credit really does not have to be perfect for this program. We can't accept bad credit per se, but if they have a few instances of, you know, some little blips, that might be okay. 
you know, we want to take a look at their overall credit record and make sure that they've demonstrated an ability and a willingness to repay their obligations. You know, they might have a, a collection on there that they, they didn't know about or from way long ago. And, and usually we can work with some of those. Now, generally a credit score of 640 and above is reduced documentation. That's not a credit um, benchmark at all. That's just reduced documentation. It does not have to be 640. Um, lower scores just require some additional evaluation. And the other thing we can do is we can build a non-traditional or an alternative credit history. So if we have somebody come in that doesn't have any credit, has not built any credit, we can get you know uh, utilities or cell phone bills. I think one time we even used a Netflix account. <laughs> so we can build uh, them a, tr a credit history. Um, so again, we don't have a set minimum credit score at all. We're just gonna take a look at their overall credit. Okay, I mentioned the mortgage limits under our direct program, and here they are. Most counties in Nebraska are 285,000. Uh, Lincoln, Logan, and McPherson County are actually $346,800, excuse me, $346,850. Um, I don't know why those three counties are so much higher. I think that's sort of odd, but that's just the way it came out. Um, these limits have gone up pretty significantly over the years. Um, at one point we were down like to 197, 815 or something like that. So, um, you know, these are pretty generous mortgage limits. I think in a lot of rural communities, um, you could purchase a home for this. Well, anyway, before this market, I, I would hope still. Um, it does get a little tricky to do new construction with these limits. Um, so a lot of times we'll work with, you know, Habitat for Humanity or a builder, just your basic starter home plan. It's definitely not going to build you your big dream home, uh, but, but this is what we have to stay within under the direct program. And again, remember, it's a subsidized program, so it's not, you know, the dream home. It's just getting people into affordable homes. I want to just touch really briefly on the payment assistance because this is always kind of a mystery item. Um, but that enhances the repayment ability. It can temporarily lower their monthly mortgage payment. 1% is the lowest it will ever go. And that full note rate that's in effect at the time of closing is the highest it will ever go. So it could be, for example, right now it's 1% up to 2.5%. It might fluctuate a little bit within that based on their income, but it'll never go below or above those rates. We do review their household income annually. It might even be biannually now. That's done by our servicing center. They send out a little packet. Uh, they have to report their income and that could adjust, uh, either go up a little higher or a little lower based on that uh, uh, income increase or decrease. But again, it'll never go below 1% and never above that full no rate. One more question. Yes. Are USDA requirements similar to FHA regarding required repairs, such as a safety issue? Yeah, we are going to look at health and safety. Um, I do have a slide coming up about the properties themselves, but definitely are going to look at health and safety issues. And I'll, I'll expand on that in just a minute here. Um, a portion of that recapture that I just mentioned, or the subsidy, um, is going to be recaptured at the end of the loan. And this is the part that gets really confusing. Um, if they uh, pay off the loan, they sell the property, or they no longer occupy the property, a portion of that recapture may come into repayment. Now, I typically tell people it's about 20 to 50% of what they received over the life of the loan in payment assistance, uh, but it'll never, I, I don't know that I've ever seen it be the full amount. Um, what they're gonna do is sign a promissory note at loan closing, and then they're going to si uh, sign a subsidy repayment agreement. And that's basically the part where government comes in, makes a portion of their house payment for them, in turn, giving them that reduced interest rate. And then when one of these three scenarios happens, that's when the repayment comes into play. So, and, and there's a big long uh, formula that our servicing center goes through to get that amount of subsidy recapture. But 
I do always want people to be aware of this. Uh, we get borrowers at the end of their loans, they pay off and then they find out, what's this I have to pay off? But there's, there's more to pay off. Um, yeah, but it helped them be in a home when they probably couldn't have otherwise because that gov the government was coming in and making a portion of, of their house payment. So this is a, a kind of a good thing to educate people on is that, that they're going to receive assistance, but there may be a portion that they'll have to pay back. So here's where we get into a little bit about the properties themselves. Of course, it's got to be a residential property. It's got to be deep, safe, excuse me, decent, safe, and sanitary, structurally sound, and functionally adequate. But I don't know many people that want a home that isn't those things. Um, it can be existing or new construction, like I mentioned. We can do new or existing modular homes, but we can only do new manufactured homes. These are typically a 33-year loan, but if it's a manufactured home, which is basically your trailer home, then it's only a 30-year loan. Um, again, we can only do new manufactured. Of course, there's a difference between modular and manufactured, and it's mostly in the construction standards. But the manufactured is what you think of when you think of the old trailer homes with the steel undercarriage. They're very nice now, way different than they used to be. But the loan term is a little different. Again, we can loan for repairs up to 100% of the as improved appraised value. And we are gonna require a whole home inspection so that's gonna to need to look at the plumbing, water and sewage, the heating and cooling, the electrical, the structural if it's warranted, and then we also have to have a termite inspection. So we're not gonna nitpick every little thing. We've gotten a little more um, liberal on the, the repairs. We used to have to do a lot of things, every little thing, you know, but, but anymore we're gonna take a look at, hey, what's gonna make this property safe uh, for these people again? It's 100% financing. They don't probably have a lot of that money to be able to make repairs on down the line. So there are gonna be some um, things that we're gonna have to look at and make sure it's a good home for them. Um, you know, we want there to be very little repairs in the first three to five years of them living there, because again, they just aren't gonna have those funds. Um, eventually some repairs will be have, have to be made, but that'll be on down the line and hopefully they can they can handle that when that happens. But these, this is what we're gonna require is that whole home inspection and then any major uh, issues may have to be repaired. Okay, one more question. Sure. Can seller do home inspection ahead of time or does buyer have to order their own? Um, I don't know that we really have a hard and fast rule on that. If they've got one already, um, I think we can probably use that. Um, I don't think our handbook says anything about who has to pay for it. Probably just would want to write that into the purchase agreement so it's known, you know, and, and have the buyers ag agreeable to that because they can get their own, of course, but um, if they're willing to use the ones that the sellers have, then as long as it's written into the purchase agreement, I, don't, I really don't see um, a reason that they couldn't. And hopefully that answers that. <laughs> Okay, so they did put a limit on what is uh, considered modest because they figured, you know, if you have a bigger house, it's going to have higher utilities, higher taxes, higher insurance, higher maintenance. So they decided that modest means 2,000 square feet. That's still a pretty good size house. <laughs> um, and we can do some exceptions to that as well. Uh, some of your really small rural communities you know, they may only have these big houses that are for sale. There might not be anything else on the market. Or you might have what I call the Brady Bunch scenario. A couple gets married, they each have three kids. You may have need for a bigger house than 2,000 square foot. You have to put all those people in it. So on a case-by-case -case basis, we can take a look at getting an exception to that 2,000 square foot um, modest definition. So one quick question, it says, yep. does that include below grade? No, that's only above grade and it doesn't include the garages, okay. or porches or anything. So just above grade. What is the income to debt ratios? The income to debt ratios, uh, we have a total debt ratio of 41%. And then we have a PIT uh, ratio of 29% for very low income, but if they're low income, they can go up to 30%. 
excuse me, 33%. <laughs> Came out of my mouth wrong. <laughs> so 29 and 41 is uh, typically it, but we can sometimes go up to 33 and 41. Okay, this is how we are uh, structured in Nebraska. That's me being excited because I, for a long time, our staff was decreasing. A couple of years ago, everything in Nebraska was processed by three staff. That was a tough, tough year. Um, we have way more applications than we actually get operated, so we can't get every application approved. Um, but we're finally getting to the point where they're going to let us start hiring and staffing our, our offices up. That's going to make it a lot more easy uh, to do this. So in Lincoln, of course, that's our state office, and I'm located there. We also in the Lincoln office have Jill, uh, actually her last name is Straight now. She changed it to Jill Straight. She's a specialist. We have Larissa Flowers and Taylor Ray. Uh, they've just been with us for a year now. And then we have Sharon Cluck. She's been with us since December. She actually worked in another program area and transferred over. In Scotts Bluff, we have Tammy Stray. She's our new single family housing senior specialist. She took my old job when I went to program director position. So she actually works for the state office located in Scotts Bluff. And then we have Deb Sewer in uh, Scotts Bluff and she just told me she's retiring in August. So after my cry fest, we'll be advertising for that position and uh, getting somebody hired there. We are in the process of uh, interviewing for a, a, an assistant or a specialist in our Kearney office. We haven't had anybody there for a long time. And we uh, are just starting the process of interviewing for an assistant or a specialist in our Norfolk office. And we haven't had anybody up there for years now. So we're actually being able to increase our staff, hoping that will give us a little bit more exposure out across the state, make it easier to work with local offices. Um, so that's kind of exciting, um, hoping we can kind of kind of beef it up and, and get this rocking and rolling again. Okay, couple more questions. You bet. What is the recapture slash payback time for the loan payoff? As far as getting a payoff, I, I'm guessing, um, we have a fillable spreadsheet. It tells, or not a spreadsheet, but a, a fax cover sheet, and it tells all the information that needs to be provided to get the payoff that goes to our customer servicing center in St. Louis. Typically, it should take about five business days to get that payoff. It's a little slower because they do have to go through the calculations. Now, I know that they have been very backed up, um, and it's been anywhere from for like 10 days. Now, if somebody's looking to get a payoff and they're really struggling, get in contact with us, get in contact with me or Tammy from the state office. We can certainly try to get that elevated for you and get that uh, payoff moving a little faster. But typically it should take about five business days if we're running smoothly. Um, we've been seeing, I know they've been seeing a lot more payoffs with the low interest rates right now, uh, people refinancing and whatnot. So again, if you have any problems, please let me know and, and I'll try to help you with that. But okay. I hope another that one. answered it. Uh -huh. Okay. Um... I have a client who just got her USDA offer accepted, but we did not have a home inspection written into the contract. Will we need to go back and arrange for an inspection? Um, if it's a direct loan, yes, that inspection is going to be required. Now, if it's a guaranteed loan, you don't have to have an inspection, which I'll get into. So it is going to depend on the type of financing that they're doing. So you'll need to find out if it's a direct loan or a guaranteed loan. And I'll go over the guaranteed loan here in just a moment. Okay. What portion of the loan has to be paid off? What portion, what portion of, the of the loan has to be paid off? Paid back is what I meant. Oh, sorry. What portion of the loan has to be paid back? Um, 100% of the loan has to be paid back. But as far as the subsidy recapture for the the direct loan, I tell people it's usually about 20 to 30% that has to be paid back. 
sometimes it could be as high as 50%, but really recently we've been seeing about 20 to 50, 20 to 30% that they pay back on that recapture. I hope that's what they were asking. I hope so too. Thank you. <laughs> uh-huh. That it? <laughs> so for now. Okay. Okay. We're going to move on our little journey here. <laughs> Oh, the other thing I want to mention before we do move on is that we do now have loan packagers. These are basically people that are kind of have taken a class. They're versed in our program. Uh, sometimes we get people that need a little more hand holding going through the process. So these are entities that actually will sit down and work with our people, help them through the process of finding a home, you know, help them know how to work with a realtor. There's a lot of people out there um, that just don't understand it all. Uh, we don't always have the staff available to be able to sit down with them one on one like like we used to do in the old days. So these are actually entities that will loan package for us. So we have Blue Valley Community Action in Fairbury. We have High Plains Community Development in Shadron, NeighborWorks Northeast Nebraska in Norfolk, and Southeast Nebraska Development District in Lincoln. So um, an applicant can go straight to any of these um, entities and they'll help them complete the application. They'll gather all of their documentation. They'll actually write it up and make a recommendation whether we should find them eligible or not. Rural development gets the final say, but these people kind of help us put them together and send them to us. They'll also help them uh, get the um, property package together, you know, help them understand about working with the realtors, uh, what they need as far as inspections and all of that. So this has been kind of a, a new thing we've been doing and it seems to be working really well. I'll tell you that NeighborWorks Northeast Nebraska is probably our most active and, um, but any of these entities can assist with that as well. So something to kind of keep in mind, you know, you can say, hey, we're out in Shadron. We don't have a rural development office in Shadron. We don't know what to do. We'll pick up the phone, send an email, go see Rita at High Plains and she'll help you put that application together since there's not a rural development office there. So something to keep in mind. So how do you apply for the uh, direct loan? Well, we've got our phone number there. Um, they can basically call in right now since everybody's working from home still. They'll just leave a message with their name and phone number and we check that uh, daily a few times and then we'll have the first available specialist get back to them, can discuss the program with them, send them an application package and so on. We've also got a, an email address here that's like a, a generic email address that goes to a joint email box. So we check that throughout the day. Uh, any questions can go into that box. Even if we have realtors that have questions, please feel free to send us an email there or call the number as well. Uh, the first person that's available will get back to you with, on your question. And of course, people can always contact a loan packager um, for an application as well. So three pretty easy methods. Uh, we don't have the application online yet. We are the government. We're a little bit behind the times. It takes a while to catch up with the conventional world. So we still have to have people actually fill out an application, uh, a hard package. So, but we can get that to them very easily via one of these methods. Okay, now we're gonna move on. This is our second program. It's our guaranteed loan program. Now this is probably the biggest one. Uh, this is probably what the majority of you work with. Um, these are our big product. Um, you know, we do upwards of probably 1200 of these a year. Uh, this is a very popular program. As far as funding for this program, there are fees associated with this program uh, and it basically makes the program budget neutral. So this um, is not relying on taxpayer monies to fund this, um, so that funding can be a little more fluid throughout the year. Now with our appropriated funds for the direct program, sometimes we can run out, you know, if it's a big year and there's lots of things happening, we can run out of, of, of money. This program really uh, keeps that flow throughout the year because it is budget, budget neutral and relies on the fees and just is kind of a self-funding program. 
So here's the highlights on the guarantee. Again, this one is 100% financing too. It's not just for first time home buyers. A lot of what we get under the direct program is first time home buyers, but not always. This program is used over and over. It's such a good program. We've had people come back two and three times and use this program. Uh, these loans are made through approved lenders. So basically banks that have agreed to participate in our program. Uh, there is income eligibility requirements that I'll show you. And again, you do have to include all the household income for all the household members. Uh, this is a 30 year fixed rate loan. The interest rate is negotiated with the lender. Uh, here's the fees that I was talking about that basically fund the program. There's a 1% guarantee fee uh, that, that can also be financed. So they can roll that into their loan and have a 101% loan. Uh, there's also a 0.35% annual fee, which is kind of like mortgage insurance, but on a way cheaper uh, rate scale than what your typical mortgage insurance would be. Uh, this one has no maximum mortgage limits. So it's just whatever their ratios can support. The other program, we had those caps on the mortgage. This one doesn't have those limits. Uh, the typical, uh, Ratios on this is going to be 29 and 41, but those can increase too um, based on the entire package. Again, like the other program, we can finance necessary repairs and eligible co closing costs. That again is supported by the appraisal. And we also work a lot with uh, NIFA on this. We can do a NIFA guaranteed loan. So that lender would just have to participate in the NIFA programs and the guaranteed loan programs. So NIFA has been a big partner with us on these. So here's a look at those income limits for this guaranteed program. Again, these are new in uh, May. And you'll see that these are much more moderate income limits. Um, a household of one through four, if you look at the all other counties, can go up to $91,900. And a household of five through eight people can go up to 121,300 people. And of course, it varies by county. It's a much smaller list, though. So um, we can really get a lot of people under uh, this guaranteed program with these um, income limits. As far as the credit under our guaranteed program, basically it's up to the lender to take a look at their credit. Uh, they can do some exceptions if, if they want to. Um, again, lower scores require additional evaluation, um, but they can also build the non-traditional non credit history under this program too. But again, it's mostly up to the lenders. They just have to know what our regulations are for the program and decide, you know, what they're going to accept, what they want. They may have some overlays. Uh, most of the time, these loans get sold to the secondary market. So, uh, but, but really, we leave it up to the lenders to justify or decide what they're going to accept here. So here's where we come into that question that was asked. For existing properties under our guaranteed program, that property just has to meet the HUD minimum property standards. Now, if they want to have an inspection done, that's fine, but rural development does not require it for the guaranteed program. So basically that appraiser is just gonna certify on the appraisal that that property meets the HUD minimum property standards. So that's where the person that asked the question is gonna to have to know which program it is if it's the direct or the guaranteed. The direct's gonna require that whole home inspection the guaranteed will not. And hopefully that answers that question for that person then. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> I'm sorry, there was a question back from the last slide, Krista. What uh -huh. about bankruptcies? They are gonna have to take a look at some of those major items. If there's a bankruptcy or a foreclosure, um, I'm not saying it can't be done, Bankruptcies, we usually look at the last three years. If they are three years from that bankruptcy, uh, they're probably fine. And that's on either program. Now, sometimes we've seen where a bankruptcy, a person had a bankruptcy, but they still have a pretty high credit score. Um, and if they have some good justification for that bankruptcy, say they were in a bad accident, had some medical bills, but they can provide us documentation as to why that occurred. And it, it was good, you know, good documentation. We may still be able to do a loan for that person, even if they've had a bankruptcy. 
So there are different, you know, allowances for different credit situations. Um, the guaranteed, where the, where the direct doesn't have a, a base score, the guaranteed does have a minimum score of 580. Uh, but again, it's going to depend on if that lender is going to accept that or not. Of course, a lot of lenders don't like seeing scores that low. They want them up, you know, at least in the, in the 600s. But it's going to be their uh, decision if they're going to accept it or not. And then if it's a direct loan, it'll be up to our staff to decide if they've got good documentation on some kind of um, a credit blip. So bankruptcy doesn't automatically throw you out of the program. It's just going to depend on the reasoning for it and the documentation that you can provide. We may even have some of those cases for foreclosures. Maybe they went through a divorce and the spouse got the property, but let it go through foreclosure. You know, if you can document that and provide it to us and we can clearly see that, we might still be able to work with that. So there are a lot of different things that, that we can take a look at that's not a hard and fast booted from the program. So kind of keep that in mind. If you do have scenarios um, that you want to talk to us about, you know, get in touch with us. We can, we can you know, see what you've got. Okay, as far as the properties also under the guaranteed program, the property does have to be considered residential, but we can loan on acreages under the guaranteed program. We won't loan on acreages as much under the direct program because it is a subsidized program. But under the guaranteed program, there is no subsidy involved. So we can loan on acreages. Uh, we just can't have any farm related property or properties that are used primarily for agriculture. So no commercial enterprises, nothing with a car lot on it or you know, a herd of cows or clear you know, farm ground. Now, if they have a little hobby farm and they wanna do a, have a few goats for 4-H, that's not a big problem. It's just when we get into the actual, you, know, you can tell this is a farm, you know, that, that's when we're going to run into problems there. But, but this program is a lot more open uh, to being able to do additional land uh, that we wouldn't be so open to on the direct program. Are there any restrictions if a property is in a flood zone? Um, we do have some of those for um, <clears throat> both programs. Um, under the guaranteed, you would have to get an elevation survey just to make sure it was out of the 100 year flood zone. Uh, we can still loan on uh, some of those properties, but of course, then you get the flood insurance involved, which is quite pricey, uh, but that's not an automatic throw it out of the program either. There just may be some additional, you know, things like the flood, ins uh, flood insurance, the elevation cert. If that elevation cert shows that it is low, the, the, the lowest floor is below, the 100 year floodplain, that's when we get into the situation of not being able to loan on it. So just some additional um, um, things that may have to be checked off that list if it's in a floodplain. Okay, to apply for the guaranteed program, um, a, an applicant can basically go out to our website, uh, they find the, the, the programs and you're going to find the single family housing program. There's a tab that says to apply and you can see in that circle there that there is a list of active lenders. It is searchable by state and they can just click on that, find the lender of their choice that's approved for the program. Uh, we have Nebraska lenders that are local. There's also a list of nationwide lenders that, that will go all over you know, the country. Um, they can basically go to that um, lender directly They'll work with them on the process. They'll fill out the application with them, um, you know, work with them on any prequal questions they have. Uh, just go directly to that lender to apply. So basically, the applicant is the customer of the bank. That bank is the customer of rural development. The bank completes an underwritten package. They send it to rural development to just review it to make sure that they've underwritten it in compliance with our regulations. Uh, we used to do this on the state level and had staff here in Nebraska that did this, but it's been converted to a national team 
So they have people from all over the country on teams that review these uh, loan packages. Um, RD, if they've underwritten it okay, RD issues them a conditional commitment, which is basically they're okay to go ahead and close. And RD issues a 90% guarantee on the loan to that lender. So again, we do a lot of these loans. Lenders love that 90% guarantee. Uh, it's a zero down payment, so it's a win-win for everybody on this. Going back to your last slide about the acreages, uh, we have uh -huh. a question regarding, are acres a factor for loan of acreages? Not under the guaranteed program, no. If we get into the, or into the direct, then we can only have a certain percent of that appraised value be the land or the acreage. With it. But under the guaranteed program, doesn't matter. There's no limit on it. Nope. Thank you. And that's also so where it's really important to know which program you're working with. And it's kind of tricky sometimes and a lot of people don't realize that we have the two separate programs. So um, that's a big, big thing is to know which program that your, your borrowers are, are working with if you can factor the guarantee because there are some differences. Um, this is just a little chart and actually it needs to be redone because these interest rates are a little high. You can see 4%, we haven't seen that for a while just kind of a comparison be between the different um, government products. Just shows, you know, the FHA program, of course, you have to have some upfront and annual fees, but you'll see that that's all uh, less with the government products, with the guaranteed, uh, it's a lot less of a fee. The RD, of course, doesn't have any fees, the direct loan. Um, the down payment requirements with the FHA, you have to have a 3.5%. With all of the RD products, there's no uh, down payment requirement. You'll see the differences in the upfront fees. The FHA is a little more than the guaranteed. And of course the RD direct doesn't have any. Um, so, and then the annual mortgage insurance that really comes into play too. You'll see the FHA is a lot higher than the uh, guaranteed loan and uh, the direct loan doesn't have any again. So just, you know, kind of a comparison, like if this was a $100,000 loan, we were still in the times when the interest rates were 4%, oh, that's high. Um, just kind of a total bottom line that you can see there. The other thing that's kind of interesting to point out, to work here, uh, is here's the RD direct at the full note rate on $100,000, you'll see 426.16, doesn't include uh, taxes and insurance. And then you'll see the full subsidized RD direct at 1%, and the difference that can make 296.58. So with some of these borrowers, that subsidy really does help them. Uh, when you're looking at a $300 payment versus an over $400 payment, that's where that subsidy comes into play. And then of course, here's the FHA, the RD guaranteed, maybe a little lower with the NIFA. So um, just kind of a, a good example that, that you can take a look at to see you know, what the differences are and why this could be a good program for some of some of your clients. Uh, I do just want to, oh, yep. Quick questions, I'm sorry. I referred no my buyer, a question is, I referred my buyer to apply for the direct loan. The lender told the buyer they had to be homeless to qualify. Is that always the case? No, not, not at all, not at all. If they're in a rental, that's fine. <laughs> There's no, nobody needs to be homeless. We don't want anybody to be homeless. <laughs> um, they could be renting. Um, some of our direct program borrowers even may own a home, but maybe it's not structurally sound. Maybe it's falling down. Maybe they have six kids in a bedroom home. Those would be other reasons we could go ahead and, and make a loan. So I, I'm not sure where that information is coming from, but that is absolutely not the case. No, nobody needs to be homeless. And it would be pretty tough, I think, to, to be prepared to buy a home if you're homeless. We'd probably wanna you know, walk them up the ranks of maybe they need to go to one of our subsidized apartments and then prepare for, for purchasing a home. But that, yeah, I don't know where that's coming from, but that is definitely not the case. <laughs> okay, well, she said that, said that the couple was renting. Okay, yeah, that's no problem. Now you're saying it's a guaranteed loan, which would mean it was told by our staff, which I'm having trouble believing that it could happen. If 
if it was a lender, a bank that told them that, you know, I, I'm not sure what the deal was there, but you know, it, please feel free to reach out to me if that was truly a, a direct loan and uh, let me follow up because the other thing I'll say is we do have some newer staff that are still learning. So if somebody told them that from our staff, then we need to, we need to check into that because that's not, that's not accurate. Does that answer that hopefully? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, I just want to make quick mention that we do have 504 repair loans and grants available for homeowners. So I know some of you talk to a variety of people. If you would get any inquiries, hey, we're, we own a house, but it's you know not in the best shape. Um, we do have some programs out there available for them as well. And here's just some examples of some things we've been able to do with our 504 program, which is just repair funds and what a difference that can make for a community and for a homeowner too. So just, just wanna have that on your radar. If you would run into anybody that needs repairs in their home, that is something we can take a look at too. This is reserved for very low income individuals, but I know we have some of the homes like this and very low people that very low income people that don't know how to get repairs made and we do have a program available for them. Okay, we're kind of getting down to the to the end here. I'm just gonna share a few resources with you all. Um, here, of course, probably our biggest thing is our website. Um, if you just end at the GOV of, in this website, it's gonna go to kind of a national page. If you put the slash NE, you'll actually get to Nebraska. Um, on our homepage, you'll see these key programs here in this red circle. And we have our different programs here. You can see the direct housing loans, repair loans and grants, guaranteed I think is on down here, but all of the programs that we offer and there's information on those programs available there. Uh, here's another thing that's out there that um, potential applicants can use. They can go in and do an eligibility assessment. Um, they're going to put in uh, their income, their debts, uh, you know, their household size. When they get all through that, at the end, it's going to give them um, something that says, hey, you might be eligible for the direct program, or you might be eligible for the guaranteed program, or you might be eligible for both. You know, so it's just kind of a starting place if they don't know if they're going to be able to, to qualify. It's not an actual decision maker. It's just, a, hey, this might work for you. And of course, we do have a property eligibility map. Um, when you pull this up, you'll see the state of Nebraska. These um, areas that are kind of shaded in this uh, kind of yellowish, those are the ineligible areas you can actually put an address in here and make sure that it's an eligible property. So, hey, we wanna do an RD loan. Does this house qualify for it? And again, you'll see all the eligible areas here too. This comes in especially handy if you get up around Omaha or Lincoln or outside any of these kind of metropolitan areas. Um, if you go to our website right now, we just celebrated June, it's Home Ownership Month. And we did this really nice short little video uh, with this family, Katrina Johnson. It is really cool. Um, it was actually a package loan. It was done by NeighborWorks Northeast Nebraska and then went through our direct program. She actually started out with a bank, but they couldn't do what they needed to for her and referred her to our direct program. And it's just a really cool story. So if you have a couple minutes, just go to our website, uh, scroll down on the Nebraska highlights and just take a quick um, listen to that video. It's just, it, it's really good. It just, it reminds me of why I do what I do. Um, Cause you know, day in and day out, you know, we can all get a little like, uh, <laughs> but then you watch something like this and it's just like, oh, that is so cool. And it, it just really reminds me of why I do this. Um, job, you know, it's really not for the glamour <laughs> or the or the big bucks. It, it's for these kind of scenarios. You get to see somebody so happy with becoming a homeowner and be able to do it and do it affordably, and it's just so cool. So I'd encourage you to go out and, and just take a quick listen to that because I just I just think it's it's so well done and really neat. So basically, at the end of the day, at the end of this presentation. 
when you think of USDA and rural development, I really don't want you to think of that cow right away. Don't think of the meat packing plate. Um, you know, I want you to think about all of these real families that we've helped in rural Nebraska to get into homes. Uh, and these are all of our applicants and the success stories for us. And, and that's pretty awesome. It's just, it, it's a neat thing. So with that, I'm gonna go to, does anybody have any other questions? Again, there's our website. That's really great uh, place for information. And uh, we'll kind of wrap it up. Does anybody have any other questions? Yeah, we do have another one. It's okay. the lady's asking, does the 504 repair loan also have the geographic limits? It does. It still has to be in an eligible area. So you can go to that eligibility website and put in a, a um, an address and it'll tell you if it's an eligible or not. Yeah, it sure does. Rural, rural Nebraska again. Okay. Anybody else have any questions they, they want to ask you? Feel free to unmute yourself if you do and ask, uh, yeah. ask Krista, the queen of USDA, if your question. Yep. Oh, here we go. Oh, thank you. Everybody's saying thank you. <laughs> great, great. I hope I was able to give you a little, you know, some good information to think about and, and some food for thought. Um, you know, again, if you come across any applicants in, in rural Nebraska that need help, um, here's a couple of resources for you. You know, we're, uh, you know, some of these borrowers may be a little lower income, aren't going to buy the big mansions, but, you know, they still qualify for a commission too, you know. Right. Well, everybody is telling you thank you, Chris. It was very good, very much appreciated. Yes. That was awesome. And th your PowerPoint was phenomenal. Seriously, it was great. <laughs> it's goofy. <laughs> yeah, you did a great job with it. I enjoyed it. <laughs> like I said, I make it as entertaining as I come because government material is usually really boring, and nobody just wants to sit and read screens. So. So that, that's what I got for you. <laughs> well, I will get this recording out to yeah. everybody that's registered okay. for the class. So it's all good. Yeah. I don't know, Krista, thank you very much for um, the information. Yeah. It was very valuable. So, okay, I will send you a copy of this PowerPoint to Christy and I'll get you some contact sheets and a couple of those little report sources that you can share with everybody. Great, awesome. Okay, okay. okay. Sounds good. Thanks, Thanks everybody, have a great day. Yep, have a good one, bye-bye. Bye-bye.